of convict blood and sweat, had a brash upbringing from convict settlement to Australia's first city, all in the space of a mere 50 or so years after the arrival of the first fleet. Burial of the dead demanded immediate attention. Established without treaty with the Indigenous owners, our far-flung colonial outpost of the British Empire had lofty ambitions and, through opportunity, adventure and occasional misadventure, eagerly took its place in the new world. Despite being geographically on the other side of the world, the first colonial authorities, new settlers and even the majority of the convict class still saw themselves as British and retained their customs and traditions from the cradle to the grave. Birth and death are part of a community's life cycle. On arrival, the first fleeters were faced with a litany of challenges. Build accommodation, guarantee food supply, arrange medical care and see to the continuance of religious observation, including baptism to burial. The voyage of the First Fleet, with its charge of 736 male and female prisoners, had taken an exhaustive 252 days and, although maintaining a surprisingly low death rate, the convicts and crew arrived in an extremely weakened condition and many died soon after disembarkation. Reverend Richard Johnson, the first Christian cleric in Australia, memorably put it, The convicts arrived wretched, naked, filthy, dirty, lousy, and many of them utterly unable to stand, to creep, or even to stir hand or foot. There were hundreds of deaths in the first five years of the colony. Death by natural and unnatural cause had to be dealt with. Even executed convicts had to be given a respectful burial. Members of the military were generally given a full burial with Marines and members of the New South Wales Corps participating in the funeral procession and final salute. Depending on rank, the regimental band was called upon to play the Dead March from Seoul. Childbirth in the young colony was also a particular challenge. If you did survive the cradle, life expectancy around the year 1800 was between 30 to 40 years. The first settlement was centred around the area we know as the Rocks. It was in walking distance to Carter's Barracks, the Convict Stockade, General Hospital, Church and the Wharf. Governor Phillip's brief had been to make the settlement work quickly. There was little time for a grander vision. For health reasons, bodies of the deceased had to be buried quickly, and although we cannot establish the exact location of the 1788 burial ground, it is believed to have been close near Cadman's Cottage on the harbour foreshore. No doubt this was too close for comfort, and a second site was used from 1790 near what became York Place Laneway, behind Wynyard Station. Once again, as the settlement grew, so did concern about the proximity of the cemetery. With little foresight, a new cemetery area was designated in 1792 at the far end of George Street, where Sydney Town Hall now stands, simply known as the burial ground and later the old burial ground, it was convenient to the small St Andrew's Church, which later, in 1819, had the foundation stone laid for St Andrew's Cathedral. The burial grounds were unenclosed in 1802, but in the Sydney Gazette of February 5, 1804, a proposition was made to fence it in because of pigs and goats rooting up the ground. After much protest, it was surrounded by a low timber and brick wall. 
By all reports, it continued to be neglected, and pigs and goats and vermin remained to create havoc in the grounds. Headstones were broken, graves collapsed, and even reports of coffins being broken into by vandals stealing the lead casings. Unpleasant smells arising from the grounds became unbearable in hot weather. It was also recorded in a committee report that men utilised the old burial ground to answer the calls of nature. The old burial ground served the colony up until 1820, when it was replaced by the Devonshire Street Cemetery, which was also known as Sand Hills or Brickfield Cemetery because of its position on Brickfield Hill, where Central Railway now stands. This was a rambling and disorganised burial ground and, because of the population explosion following the 1851 discovery of gold, by 1860s it had already reached capacity. In 1860 the Colonial Secretary for Lands, John Robertson, announced the search for a new cemetery. Persons who may be willing to dispose of not less than 100 acres of land, which may be suitable for a general cemetery, or near the Great Southern Railway between Sydney and Parramatta, are requested to communicate with this department, describing the position of the land and stating the area and price. The following year, the government purchased 200 acres of the Liberty Plains estate, Haslam's Creek, near Homebush, on the newly opened Sydney to Parramatta rail line, the owners pocketing the sum of £10 per acre. Haslam's Creek Cemetery, or Rookwood, as it became known, heralded the new Victorian approach to funerals, where cemeteries were visually attractive and a place of contemplation. The new cemetery was consecrated in 1867 to coincide with the closure of the Devonshire Street Cemetery. It soon became known as the Necropolis, the ancient Greek name for the city of the dead, the Sleeping City. The first burial in 1867 was a pauper, John Whalen, aged 18 years, a native of Ireland. He had been in the colony for nine months. Eight years later, the Sydney Morning Herald reported, the necropolis grounds are tastefully laid out with shrubs and parterres, divided by neatly kept paths. Chapels have been erected for each denomination in which to read the burial service over the last remains, the style of architecture being generally modern Gothic. In 1876, local resident Richard Slee wrote to the Cumberland Mercury, suggesting... Rookwood is a pleasant name and a very appropriate one, for there are many crows in the neighbourhood. <coughs> it is more likely Rookwood was named after the Grand Victorian Brookwood Cemetery in London. Whatever its origins, the new name found favour, and by 1878 Rookwood was in common use for both the cemetery and the railway station. Western Sydney was also growing and before long the locals called for a new name for their railway station. Lidcombe distinguished the cemetery from Rookwood. Other cemeteries opened to service local communities. However, Rookwood's expansive grounds were open to all takers and still remain Sydney's main cemetery. The Victorian Christian expression of death was one of solemn funerals, horse-drawn processions, ornate sandstone carved headstones, often with poetic inscriptions, family vaults, ornate statuary depicting angels, fruit and floral tributes, and expansive parklands where the dead resided in pleasant memorial gardens. Sydney undertakers led the funeral processions, there was even a custom of funeral mutes, men employed to dress in black, look painfully saddened and march in front of the hearse. The railway was intrinsically linked to the story of the Rookwood Necropolis. It was a deciding factor in the cemetery's establishment. In 1867, the Sydney Morning Herald announced a twice-daily service from Sydney's central station number one, 
it stopped at stations along the way to collect mourners. Return tickets were one shilling each way. The corpses travelled free. The government, wanting a separate funeral terminal from the main central station, built an imposing Gothic-designed receiving house at Regent Street, Redfern. A similar building was also constructed in 1869 in the very centre of the cemetery. It was one of three necropolis stations. The mortuary bell was tolled a half hour before the trains departed the cemetery as a warning to mourners and visitors. No one wanted to be late for that train. The mortuary train operated for over 80 years until 1948. Death comes to all, be they young or old, rich or poor, and over one million souls now reside in Rookwood's parklands. The notorious, including convicts, gangsters and bushrangers, who share with the notable, including suffragette Louisa Lawson, comedian Roy Reen, fiery politician Big Jack Lang, pioneer retailers Anthony Horden and David Jones, Sydney Morning Herald founder John Fairfax and the 19th century celebrated Chinese businessman Mei Kuang Tart. Our cemeteries are also roadmaps of the history of Sydney, and many of the inscribed headstones, in just a few words, tell stories about the lives of the people who forged the city's culture, architecture, commerce, industry and politics. For example, Jack Lang's headstone simply reads, Premier of New South Wales. Charles Ledger, he gave quinine to the world. James Bintz states he was the first to introduce electric light to Oxford Street and Rachel Lavington's reads, first Australian descendant of Captain J. Cook. Others point to the early emigrants who died on the long voyage to Australia. Edward Ramsey Thompson died of rheumatic fever on board the SS Almeida and was buried at sea. Other stones tell of premature death. John Moore, aged 16, whose premature death was caused by the bite of a snake and Stanley Herbert Sawyer, aged eight, who was killed by a tram on his way to school. Some headstones see friends or the departed getting the last laugh. William Patterson Gray, too quick and sudden was the call, his sudden death surprised us all. Archibald Stuart Peterson, a cartoonist for the Sydney Sun newspaper from 1939 to 52, left a very tantalising message. I'll be back. Our multicultural society has many ways of marking the transition from life to death, from simple to ornate, with silence or with noise. Some customs call for intricate burial ceremonies, others call for simplicity. Today, Sydney's burial grounds represent over 300 different ethnic groups in our cultural melting pot. Death is the great leveller.